So the most of these uh, green and blue dots on the left, left side, these are direct band gap materials and the black dots are indirect band gap materials. So, so mainly the uh, material I started my research is from uh, gallium nitride. So gallium nitride has 3.4, around 3.4 EV band gap. And then uh, for your reference, the band gap of uh, silicon is about 1.1 EV. So compared to that, the uh, band gap of gallium nitride is called white band gap. <clears throat> and uh, my, most of the work is actually uh, even wider than that. So during my PhD program, I work uh, mostly on the aluminum nitride, which is 6.2 EV, and aluminum gallium nitride alloys. So after my PhD work, I work a little bit on the zinc oxide material and its alloy. And, uh, uh, and currently, I'm working on uh, this hexagonal boron nitride matrix. So why I'm interested on in these materials? Because these materials can be used to develop uh, ultraviolet light emitting diodes. And that can be used for solid state lightning. So these days, uh, there are several uh, LED, LED lamps we are using at home, and I think it is also available in Nepal. And this is also, these are also widely used. LEDs are very widely used. It's the next generation uh, light source. They are also used in the room, uh, inside the room for uh, light with different colors. So uh, these are also used in a uh, street lamp. So there are many projects going on to replace the conventional lamp by LEDs. Uh, the reason LED lamps are uh, uh, widely used is because its efficiency is very high. And also uh, there are some disadvantages in the current uh, compact fluorescent lamp because that uses the, the mercury. So mercury is poisonous, so this also needs to be replaced. So main reason is, is its efficiency is very high. So besides that, uh, ultraviolet can be used for uh, this uh, bioagent uh, chemical uh, detection, uh, water and air purification, medical research and healthcare, meaning, meaning this, uh, this ultraviolet light source can be used to kill bacteria. The reason we can use uh, ultraviolet to kill the bacteria is if you look at the solar spectrum, uh, UVC, UVC band, which is below 280 nanometer, that reason is absorbed by ozone. So that's why in the earth, we don't have that uh, UVC. So because of the because we don't have UVC from the uh, sunlight, the bacteria, which is a bio-organic material, they have not developed immunity to uh, immunity from the UVC. So, so because of that, if we shine with UV light on the bacteria, it will kill them. And and UV, UV light, ultraviolet in the UVC light is produced uh, only by human being because it cannot be, it, it is not coming from uh, solar, solar system. And uh, since the UV LED structure can be uh, used as LED, if you use the in the reverse process, that can be used as ultraviolet. And also there is a, ultraviolet detector, so that can be also used for different uh, uh, purposes, something like missile threat detection, UV radiation monitoring. For example, if somewhere in the world or somewhere, if there is missile uh, launch, then 
it also emits ultraviolet ultraviolet light during that uh, missile launching so we don't get the uvc uvc from outside of the uh, earth so if we detect uvc light then that is made by man made so it could be due to missile so that gives the flag there may be somewhere a missile uh, launching at that point so that's why it can be used for uh, that kind of detection and also ultraviolet i mean uh, this white banner materials are also used in recently they can be also used for single photon emitter and that can be used as a quantum qubit for the quantum information processing so i will discuss a little bit about that uh, at the end so because uh, solid state lighting is so important in our uh, daily life so these three uh, Japanese scientists got the Nobel Prize of Physics in 2014. So their contribution was mainly in the uh, development of blue LEDs, blue LEDs, uh, and uh, they use gallium nitride. So gallium nitride was a uh, white band gap material, and uh, the problem was to synthesize the good quality material and also to produce p-type material and these three people uh, scientists they work uh, independently i mean separately i think uh, uh, akasaki and amano was together so later on they, they developed a method to produce a blue led and why blue blue is important is the uh, red color and the green color was already there but without blue it's not a complete color and without blue we cannot make it white and white light is the one we use for our uh, uh, general purpose light so so once they develop uh, Blue LED, I think it's around uh, 1992. Now color code is complete, and then this, this can be used for white LED. Just mix the uh, different color LEDs. We can make it RGB. And also, if we can mix three color in a different ways, different intensities, then we can take color of our room. Depends on our mood. So if you like, uh, a daylight time, make it like a morning time, we can make it like yellowish. If it is a romantic mercury vapor, it emits the UV light. I think it's around 253 nanometer. And that UV LED is absorbed by the phosphor, which is coated inside the tube. And then it converts into white light. So once we, if we can make the UV LED, at the 250 nanometer then we can simply put the phosphor on that and we can uh, generate the white light so the mercury is poisonous so that's why uh, it will be also replaced uh, at certain point and uh, the next generation lamp is the light emitting glass and this also shows here the brightness of the light meaning it's the efficiency the uh, incandescent lamp is efficiency like a three four percent that means out of 100 rupees we spend we only get the four 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 rupees of the light and in the fluorescent lamp it's like a 10 percent or 12 percent so still we spend 90 rupees in the heat waste of uh, money and the leds are like a 40% efficiency. So still we are spending uh, lots of wasted money, but uh, this is much better than the uh, incandescent lamp. So <clears throat> I'm going to go uh, give a little bit more uh, basic uh, semiconductor physics here. Might be useful for uh, students. So semiconductor materials important uh, physics is band gap so this band gap is the 
uh, energy gap between conduction band and uh, valence band. And that conduction band and valence band, if you plot in the uh, propagation vector k axis, so the band structure will be something like this. And the distance between the top of the uh, band, which is the lower one, uh, inverted uh, from top of lens band to the bottom of the lens band, that's the band gap. So that we call the energy band gap EG. And in some materials, the K value is momentum. Momentum value is same for the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction. In some materials, the bottom of the conduction band is a different K value from top of the valence band. So if the K values are different, the momentum is different, and that's called the indirect band gap material. So silicon is one of one of that kind of material. And the gallium nitrate is the direct band gap material, so that's why it has the same uh, momentum vector, k value, for the top of the valence band and the bottom of the valence band. And that's called the direct band gap. So what's the importance of this direct and indirect is, if we excite the electron from valence band to conduction band, those electrons from the conduction band to decay down to low energy level, that means uh, to the valence band. And during that transition, if it is a, a direct band gap material, the K value is same. That means momentum is same before and after. In the indirect band gap, the momentum, the K value is different before and after. So it's like a, a a collision, a collision process. So in the collision process, momentum before and after should be same. And if the K value is same before and after, that means K is not changing. So only the change is the energy. Okay? So all this energy will convert into the radiation. In case K value is not same, then then the K has to be conserved. So in that case, <laughs> this process needs to involve uh, some phonon to conserve the momentum. So, so that means uh, uh, during this the indirect band gap transition, some phonon will be involved. And because of that, the radiative efficiency is very small then that kind of material cannot be used for the light emitting dye. So that's why silicon cannot be used for the light emitting dye. Silicon is used widely for in the semiconductor for making diode, for making processor, for making transistors, but silicon is not used for the uh, light emitting dye. So for that case, we need a direct band gap material. So that's one requirement for the uh, light emitting diode. And another requirement is, we should have P-type and the N-type uh, material. So when we make the uh, light emitting diode, so it's, it's something like this. We should have the N-type reason and P-type reason. So N-type reason means the material has uh, lots of uh, free electrons. P-type means it has lots of uh, free hole. So holes will be in the valence band electron will be in the conduction band. And if we make the uh, sandwich of N type and P type, so one side will have lots of electron, another side will have lots of hole. And once you put the battery, if you connect the P type to the positive terminal of the battery and N type to the negative terminal of the battery, then we, we push the electron and hole together uh, to the junction. And, and there, the electrons from the n-type and hole from the p-type will recombine. And that recombination gives the 
uh, radiation. And what is the uh, radiation frequency of the radiation? That is same as the energy band gap. So lambda is equal to H C divided by the uh, band gap. So if you want to have the uh, deep UV ultraviolet region, band gap should be higher. So depends on what is the wavelength of the material, wavelength of the light you like to produce, you have to have the corresponding uh, band gap. And the band gap is specific for the specific material. So if you want to change the if you want to change the color, so one way direct one way is to change the material. You have to use the different material. And there's a little bit another uh, uh, engineering we can do to tune the wavelength. So in the modern uh, light emitting diode, <coughs> we not only simply uh, put the one layer of N type and another layer of P type, we actually make a quantum well, quantum well between N type and P type. So uh, when we make the quantum well, it's easy to push the electron and hole towards the well and the electron and hole are confined in a small region. So there is a more probability of uh, uh, emission. So this way we can also increase the efficiency of the material, efficiency of the LEDs. So in some cases we can have many uh, such quantum wells uh, that we call uh, multiple quantum well. And uh, so, so, so in the wide band gap semiconductor or even any other semiconductor, how do we make the N type and how do we make the P type material? So let's say we have one uh, material. We have connection band and the valence band. And EG is the band gap. So band gap is wide. Wide means uh, it's very, very, uh, very high energy compared to the room temperature thermal energy. So room temperature, if we take uh, 300 K, uh, it is like a 25, milli electron volt. So if the band gap is within that 25 milli electron volt or even, even uh, let's say 100 milli electron volt or even 0.5 uh, electron volt, there will be some electron uh, uh, excited from valence band to the conduction band. So that exactly happens in the uh, germanium. So if the gap is much, much higher, wider, then there is no way to generate electron in the conduction band from valence band. So if we don't have the electron in the conduction band, then how do you make the N type? And also for the P type, we need to have more holes. Holes means we have to ionize the, uh, the excite the electron from the valence band and then uh, make empty spots. So that's the whole. So, so the idea is we introduce some impurities and any impurities will have energy level inside the gap. We need to find material whose level is near the conduction band. So that if the level is near the conduction band, then this difference between uh, this uh, level has a small law. So, so then even from the room temperature, we can excite some of those donors and that will give the free electron in the conduction. Then that becomes material, the, the material becomes conduction band, con uh, N type. For the uh, P type material, we have to find another impurity material. And then the, that material energy level of the that level is near the valence band. Then the electron from the valence band can excite, and they will be captured by the acceptors. Then we have lots of hole. Then that material becomes uh, the p-type material. So the problem in the white band gap material is, in some cases most of the cases, if we get the 
material, meaning the impurity or the some uh, foreign elements. If if that is donor, then it makes easily intact material. Then in that material, it is very difficult to find the uh, impurity which can make p-type. So most of the examples, if, you, if, if some of you might have worked in the uh, semiconductor material, if material is easy to make p-type, then it's very difficult to make n-type. If it is easy to make n-type, then it's very difficult to make p-type. So in case of gallium nitride, gallium nitride can be made easily uh, n-type. So some, in some cases, we don't need to do anything. It becomes n-type automatically. So normally it is believed it is due to hydrogen or even uh, some uh, impurities uh, present or defects. But it's, it was very difficult to make P-type in the gallium nitride. So magnesium was used as P-type currently. And the magnesium activation energy or energy level is 160 milli electron volts. So this is still very high and those uh, three uh, Japanese uh, scientists, they found that magnesium can be used as used for the P-type doping, making, making the gallium nitride P-type. And, but it needs to have kind of excitation of the magnesium. And that's the key they developed technology. And that's why it is, it was, uh, possible to make uh, P-type and N-type gallium nitride, and after that, they, they were able to make uh, blue LED. So once blue is made, then what next? Next is, uh, we like to make the different color, short wavelength, deep ultraviolet uh, LEDs. So for that case, what do we do? We need to increase the band gap. So in order to increase the band gap, we can make the LOI of gallium nitride and the aluminum nitride and that becomes aluminum gallium nitride LY. So if you put more aluminum, if you keep adding more aluminum in the gallium nitride, it will have the band gap of the, uh, uh, this aluminum gallium nitride will keep increasing. And once it is purely aluminum nitride, it is uh, 6.2 electron volt. And if we can make uh, aluminum nitride, uh, P-type and N-type, we can make the light emitting diode which can emit 200 nanometer uh, wavelength. So 200, 200 nanometer wavelength is very, very deep, uh, extreme UV. So it is even close to X-ray. So the challenge is if we keep increasing the, the white band gap, it is the donor level and the acceptor level also becomes wider and it's become far and we get less and less uh, electron. So those are the challenges. And uh, somehow when we, when I was a PhD student, we were able to make up to uh, 280 nanometer light emitting diode. And after that, there were lots of uh, commercial companies came uh, to generate even deeper LEDs, there is still research going on. And uh, after that, uh, there are also trained on finding new materials instead of working on the nitride only. So after that, most people work on the zinc oxide. Zinc oxide also had a similar uh, issues. Zinc oxide can be made uh, n-type very easily but it's very difficult to make P-type. So many people work on the P-type, even we work on P-type material, uh, trying to make P-type zinc oxide. And we published some paper, but we, what we found was uh, zinc oxide can be made P-type, but it is not stable. So we, we can see the P-type uh, today, but uh, we, if we measure it tomorrow, its conductivity becomes uh, lower, and by next week or next month, it, it becomes insulated. 
So that's why zinc oxide uh, in person a zinc oxide is also not very uh, interesting uh, material now. So next material uh, people are working are uh, hexagonal boron nitride. So it may be useful for another deep UV material. So I have some results on that. And then, uh, uh, but that's not really for the LEDs, but there are some, something new stuff. So, so uh, some of the results we have, this is, this is from the, uh, my PSD work. So we, work, we, found, we developed uh, 200 nanometer LEDs 200 nanometer, so 280. So this is a deep UV, UVC. So it's not supposed to see with our eyes, but when we need the uh, red LED, we can see something like a, a purple, purple color or violet color, like uh, that kind of uh, light. So when we make the LEDs, how do we make the LEDs? LEDs are actually made uh, by by growing the material, normally made uh, grown on the sapphire, sapphire substrate. So after that, it deposits many, many several layers, and each layer uh, has to be uh, studied separately. And once we understand all the behavior of all the layers, then we make the basic structure is, one reason is N-type, another reason is P-type, and in the middle of that, there will be quantum waves. So, so, so based on what is the uh, band gap of the quantum wave, that controls the uh, wavelength of the light. So sapphire is 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 a uh, insulator. So we cannot make the contact from bottom. So that's why we have to cut down up to the n-type region and then uh, put the contact on the lower N type and the upper P type. So once you put the positive on the P type and the negative terminal on the uh, N type, then it will uh, inject the electron and hole and the recombination of the electron and hole gives the light. And that's what is the light emitting diode. Okay. So the one on the top, uh, which is the LED structure by uh, Nakamura. And once it gives the uh, UV light, we can put the phosphor around that. And if you put the phosphor, even, even blue light can give, uh, blue light can be converted into white light. So in that case, we are uh, making some tricks. We are not, it, it will not be pure white. It will be bluish white. So, but still from our eyes, we cannot distinguish. But if you shine into something, a different color material, then we can see that's not a real white. So if, if you buy a cheaper white LED, uh, those are normally made by a blue LED covered by a phosphor. Okay, so so uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, the theory or little bit engineering of the LEDs. And uh, uh, few slides I have here uh, about what we have in our lab <clears throat> and what we are doing. So this is the one uh, research lab I am uh, developing right now. So this is for the uh, growth facility. This is called chemical vapor deposition. So in the chemical vapor deposition, uh, we vaporize material or some gas, and that is required to deposit on the material. So deposition will be should be very very thin. Thin. It should be in the order of uh, angstrom. So so that's why we just put the vapor transport the vapor on the, on the material, normally it's on the sapphire, and deposit that. So during that process, uh, we have to maintain the pressure, we have to keep flowing some gas, we have to heat up the gas, heat up the substrate, and we have to pump out the substrate, I mean pump out the gas, 
so, so there are lots of control going on, and then it's, it's kind of a multivariable problem. There are lots of parameters, and what's the correct parameter for that process? So we have to optimize lots of parameters. And most of the time in the material development, uh, we take the time to optimize those conditions. So even in 10 years, some, some, some material takes 10 years, some material take two years, and then silicon is still improving. This were developed a long time ago, and silicon can be uh, grown with very little defect in a very big uh, fuel veins uh, substrate. So that's, that's for the material uh, synthesis, and this one is the atomic force microscope. So once we make the material, we need to know what is that material, and how is that material made, and how, what is the quality of the material. So we, we have to start looking at from our eyes, first just look at from our eyes, how it looks like, maybe it's bright, maybe it's white, or maybe it's dark, and next phase will be, how is the surface of the material? So surface has to be very, very smooth. It should be atomic. So that's why it's called the epitaxial. Epitaxial means the atomically thin layer. That's called epitaxial. So for that, we need to use an atomic force microscope. So this is one we have in our um, uh, facility. And that is mainly used to look at the surface morphology. And uh, this one is olive, very simple and widely used to determine if the material is P-type or N-type. So in the in the Hall effect, in the theory, if you remember, the uh, Hall coefficient will be negative for N-type material if the carrier is electron, and the Hall coefficient will be positive if the carrier is positive particle like like whole so so this way this is the simple way to determine if the material is p type and n type so and also it can be used to uh, find out what is the energy level of the donor or what is the energy level of the, level of the acceptor so the result we have shown here is uh, our work on uh, p type p dope zinc oxide so we also tried to uh, explore if we can make p-type zinc oxide, and we did p-type, I think phosphor dope, arsenic dope, and also I think zinc and arsenic uh, core dope. So, so our conclusion was the material has lots of uh, background electron, and also the level is too deep, and the p-type. Uh, P-type level is not uh, very stable. That's why the acceptor level is not stable. That's why it is not easy to develop P-type material. But still, we publish this in in, in the journal. And this one is a transmission electron microscope. So we use this to look at what are what is the defect, how the defects are formed or to study the structural properties of the material. So using that, one we can do is if we can clearly distinguish if the material is crystalline, a good crystalline or not. So we can see the diffraction pattern from the material because it has an electron beam and the electron beam can uh, generate the diffraction pattern. So if, if these spots are very bright, that means it's a good crystalline material. And depends on what is the shape or the structure of the geometry of the spots, that will tell us uh, what is the, the crystal structure of the material. And from the each point distance between each point, we can find out what is the distance between each level or distance between each atom in the material. So also uh, there are lots of other facilities in TEM. We can find out how the materials is growing in this third picture and how the uh, dislocations are propagating. So in order to have the good quality material, we have to have a low dislocation, low impurity, low defect. Uh, but uh, in, in principle, it's not, we cannot make a zero defect. 
and then for the beginning of the uh, material development there will be lots of uh, defects and uh, dislocations and we improve the material quality and we, we improve the develop uh, process and we have to keep looking at how the improvement is going on so this one is the one uh, we are widely using recently so this is we call deep uv deep ultraviolet photoluminescence system so the uh, our my recent phd student uh, nikes maharajan is working on this so he made a contribution to uh, develop this system so in this system uh, we have laser so solid state pumping laser and this pumps for the tie sapphire laser and the entire sapphire laser output is 780 nanometer so 780 is infrared and to study the optical properties of the material what do we do is we shine the material with the light whose energy is bigger than the band gap of the material if the band gap is B, we need to have a large energy. Large energy means wavelength of the light should be short. So 780 is in the infrared region. So infrared is the reason wavelength can be used only for the very short, uh, small band gap material. And my materials are normally wide band gap, more than three electron volt. So for that, I need I need something like at least uh, uh, 300 nanometer, shorter than, shorter than 300 nanometer. So what the system we have here is after the pi sapphire laser, that 780 nanometer. One more thing is, uh, once we have the light laser output after pi sapphire laser, that laser will be pulse, pulse laser. Pulse laser means it's a 100 femtosecond uh, pulse and it is 76 megahertz. So within that uh, 76 megahertz frequency, uh, only 100, and, uh, 100 femtosecond will have light and rest of the time there is no light. So it is a very pulse. So, so uh, since the, we, we put the, all the lights in a small pulse, then if you look at the energy density, it will be very strong. So that uh, light from the high sapphire laser is feed into the third harmonic generation. So third harmonic generation is, is a, is a non, non-linear uh, crystal. So once you put that in, it can generate two omega. Two omega means the wavelength will be half. Okay, And it can also generate Another another laser whose wavelength is divided by three, so our frequency is multiplied by three, and the wavelength will be around three hundred ninety nanometer, and the, in the third harmonic it is two hundred and sixty nanometer. So when we do the uh, this uh, harmonic generation, the power of the uh, light will be reduced a lot. So when you get the output from the tie sapphire laser, it's like a 1.3 watt. And when we come back, come to the third harmonic generation, it will be 130 milliwatt. So the intensity, I mean, uh, power goes down a lot. So we can do the same thing for, for the very wide band gap material, we need wavelength like 200 nanometer or maybe less than that. So 780 divided by two, we can still make 100 divided by two and to make 195. But uh, if we do that, the output of the fourth harmonic will be almost like zero because uh, higher harmonic generation uh, reduces the power a lot. So in the fourth harmonic generation, what we do, we do we we have made one trick here we combine the third harmonic generation third harmonic output and combine with the fundamental so we are adding omega plus 
3 omega, then it becomes 2 omega. So this is different from uh, 2 omega times 2. So we are not making 2 times 2 omega equal to 4 omega, but we are making omega plus 3 omega equal to 4 omega. So after that, we get some light. Uh, the power is something like a 5, 10 milliwatt. We st that started from watt. But still, that is enough to study uh, some of the metrics. So that's what we are we are using that uh, some of our recent project. So in the photoluminescent, what do we do? We shine the material by laser of different wavelength. If we can use third harmonic or we can use fourth harmonic. Let's say we are using fourth harmonic, then then we can apply this uh, laser. To the material whose band gap is something like uh, six milli six electron volt or less, meaning we can use that for the aluminum nitride. We can just use this for the aluminum gallium nitride material or hexagonal boron nitride material. So once we put the light, it excites the electron from valence band to the conduction band, and those electron which is in the conduction band they have to come down to the lower energy level we after a certain time that time is uh, uh, around picosecond right so within that time it, they have to come down there's no other way to stay there so during that transition to the lower level uh, depends on where it ends then that difference of the energy becomes the radiation so there may be lots of possibilities if there are many energy levels within the band gap. Then we will see many, many wavelengths coming out. Uh, then uh, to find out what are the different wavelengths coming out, we look at the light coming from the material now. It is not a reflection. We are looking at the light coming from the material. And we will look at what is the intensity of the light at different wavelengths. So for that, we use the monochromator and we plot the, the graph on the computer and that's the spectrum. So I will show you some of the results here. So this one is the one uh, we studied uh, recently on uh, zinc oxide powder. So this was in collaboration with uh, Dipendra Mulmi and uh, R.C. Ramchandra Rai at Buffalo. So we published this in Journal of Luminescence. So in this case, we use the third harmonic generator and third harmonic wavelength of the laser uh, because third harmonic is good enough for the zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is like a 3.37 electron volt. So using the third harmonic generation uh, uh, generator and uh, uh, pre uh, that laser, we observe uh, band gap renormalization, meaning the band gap of the material uh, uh, can, be, can be tuned if we excite the material with a high intensity laser. So, so that was the uh, one study we did uh, recently. And uh, this is another one uh, we call the reflection spectroscopy. So in this case also, we sign the material with the light, but this time we are looking at the reflection. And that reflection uh, is actually, if, if there is a large, uh, large density of the electron at, at that, uh, at that uh, energy level, then reflection will be maximum. Meaning reflection is actually electron oscillation. So if we have lots of electron, we get more reflection. And that reflection can be looked at in a different ways that we call the modulation spectroscopy. So in the modulation spectroscopy, we look at the reflection, but we will modulate the material, meaning we will put something, some another variable in the material. For example, we can apply the electric field, we can apply the pressure, or we can apply something else. So, so if we apply the pressure, if we apply the electric field, 
how much will be the change in the reflection. So that we look at in the modulation spectroscopy. So modulation spectroscopy is very, very sensitive and that can detect, uh, which cannot be detected by uh, photoluminescence. So we use this technique to study uh, resonant uh, Bragg structure. And in the resonant Bragg, Bragg structure, we observe transition from the second level to the uh, electron in the second level to the hole in the second level in the aluminum gallium-arsenide gallium arsenide quantum wells. And that was possible if we make, if we, only if we make the material in the uh, multiple quantum well, and, 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 and that has the resonant uh, structure, meaning the period is made such a way that uh, the Bragg reflection is same as the energy difference of the energy level. Okay, so I'm not going to detail on this. And then this is also one paper we published uh, from that system. So now, now I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about uh, one topic. This is our recent uh, work going on and uh, some of the results are not published yet. So, so this is deep UV photoluminescence and chemical composition analysis of residual impurities in hexagonal boronitride. So hexagonal boronitride is uh, one of the wide band gap material and whose band gap is close to six electron volt. So it is, it is a little bit lower than aluminum nitride. So the, band, uh, the hexagonal boronitride structure is, is uh, something like this, which is a layer structure. So the structure, atomic structure is same as graphene. So graphene is a layer structure, but the graphene is made from all carbon. So in, in the boronitride, this is made from boron and carbon. So only the difference is, uh, this has two compounds, the uh, boron and the nitrogen, and, and the uh, structure is hexagonal. So this is completely same as graphene. So graphene is now very popular for the uh, two-dimensional material. So if, if, if boronite, hexagonal boronite is also in the same structure, then it can be also studied same like in the graphene. But what's the... Uh, interesting point on the hexagonal boronite. So graphene is, uh, graphene is not a uh, direct band gap material, even it doesn't have a band gap. So it is, it is a conducting material and, and uh, this can, the graphene cannot be used for optical material. It is not optically active. But boronitride is optically active material Boronitride, from the boronitride, the first demonstration of lasing action on the boronitride was made in 2004. So it has lasing, lasing action, meaning uh, they, they demonstrated lasing or laser from the boronitride at 215 nanometer. The, in, in form of uh, electron volume is 5.76. So, so that means hexagonal boronitide is a optically active material, which is in the deep UV region. If it is also two-dimensional material like, like graphene, maybe we can use the graph, uh, uh, hexagonal boronitide as a, a optics and also two-dimensional material. So it must be interesting material. So that's why uh, people are interested to uh, find out more properties about the graphene. So that's why graphene is called the graphene, right? And then it is normally black, but boronitride is, its color is white. So sometimes it is called white graphene. So after that, <clears throat> boronitride has been used for uh, many uh, applications uh, like infrared nanophotonics, uh, mainly this is 
This is from the defect of the material. Single photon emitter and ultraviolet emitter because of the band gap. And also uh, the atomic structure or the lattice structure of boron nitride and graphene are very close. So uh, boron nitride is also used, used in the graphene electronics or heterostructure of boron nitride and graphene. So, so uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about this uh, single photon emitter and the ultraviolet emitter. So graphene, uh, the boron nitride has been developed or studied in the two-dimensional material. And also in the, in the two-dimensional material, it made different, uh, like a quantum dots, right? And then these areas of the quantum dots uh, can be used to generate infrared, okay? So that, that infrared, the dots are made in 60 nanometer. So that infrared emits like a atomic transition. In other words, if we look at the uh, transition of uh, helium gas, transition of uh, hydrogen gas, if you look at in the spectrum, those lines, the spectral lines are very, very fine, very, very fine. Uh, that's the atomic transition because the energy levels are so well defined and very thin line. So the transition from that is also very thin, very, very sharp. And that can be uh, used as a single Right, it could be or it could be magnetic signal. So, so in the in the uh, quantum computation or quantum information processing, uh, uh, many people are trying to use uh, radiation or a photon. Photon. So, so the photon has to be also very, very sharp, very small bandwidth, right? The line width should be very, very small. So, so the emission should be something like us atomic transition. So that's why the quantum dots and lots of other things were uh, studied. And in the, in the white band gap material, since the band gap is very wide and there is a big forbidden gap, within the, that forbidden gap, if there is some impurity or defect or dislocation, anything, they can appear within that Forbidden gap. So some of those, some of those uh, defect level or impurity level or dislocation level could be in a very very deep level, deep level, and the energy level can behave like a atomic atomic line. So if if there is an electronic transition to such line or from such line, the emission will be also like a atomic transition. So, so there are, uh, some people have observed uh, such transition in the visible and also in the infrared. And recently we observed similar transition in the ultraviolet region, ultraviolet, ultra UV region at uh, 4.09 EV. And for that we use the uh, photoluminescent system. So, so that's uh, some of the results uh, I will present here. So what we did, we use this photoluminescent system. And in this case, we use the Ford harmonic, Ford harmonic uh, 195 nanometer. So boron nitride band gap is like a 509, sorry, 5.9 EV. So even 200 nanometer is, uh, good enough to excite the electron from valence band to the conduction band. And then uh, the transition from the conduction band to the valence band gives the radiation, different uh, radiation of the different uh, wavelength. 
and that we can uh, detect in the detector. So that's the uh, spectrum. So when we uh, use this, uh, this is the material we use. So the material we got is from uh, our collaborator. So which is this boronitrate, hexagonal boronitrate single crystal. Uh, it's not thin film. And these are the pictures of AFM. And these AFM are uh, taken at after after annealing at different temperature. So they were annealed or they were heated for one hour at different temperature, 800, 900, and 1000 degrees Celsius. So after that, uh, they uh, approached us and then they wanted to see if there is any difference in the optical signal once the material is uh, annealed at different temperature. So, so we did the uh, uh, photoluminescence uh, study and this is what we got the result. So, so once, once the uh, lasing action was demonstrated in hexagonal boronitrite, so everyone thought boronitrite is a direct band gap metric. And theoretical result, most of the theoretical results says it should not be direct band gap, but the material is giving a lasing action. So, so somehow scientists were confused at that time and everyone thought it should be a direct band gap material. And even in the photoluminescence, we see the very strong emission. So if it is not direct band gap, it should not be very strong emission. But somehow the emission, nature of the emission are not like from the conduction band to valence band. And so later on, uh, uh, many uh, experimentalists perform several experiments, and it is now believed that hexagonal boronitrate is not a direct and gap material. So in that sense, this cannot be, this may not be a good for a light emitting diet, but the emission intensity of the, the boronitrate is. Uh, 10 times stronger than aluminum nitride. So, so that means that there must be something else. So the band gap of the, uh, the boronitride is something like 5.9 ED. We see very little signal here at 5.9, very strong at 5.47 and 5.78. So uh, now we believe that these peaks, although they are very strong, they are not from conduction band to valence band. They are actually transition from uh, transition with the help of phonon. So, so it is it is called a phonon S state band is transition. So in the in in the beginning I said if it is not direct band gap, the emission is not uh, it should not be strong, but but the example of boronitrate exhibits strong emission with the assistance of phonon. So this could be because it is a layer structure. When it is a layer structure, phonon may be confined in that uh, uh, in the 2D rather than in the G direction. So so it is easy to interact with the phonon, and then that's why we still see that strong uh, emission. So since we are getting light, so we should be we should be able to exploit that light emission from the uh, hexagonal boronite. So before that, we need to have the P type and N type. So uh, the resource is not there yet. So people are not. There are some report on the uh, P type and N type, but uh, there are not uh, that mean that much uh, work going on. So. In this in this work, what we found here is the uh, transition at 4.09 eV. So if you compare the emission on uh, the right side, these are the photoluminescence, and if you look at the shape of the emission, those are broad, and the 4.09 electron volt emission is very sharp. It's like a line spectrum, very 
uh, atomic like atomic transition like uh, emission. And along with that, there is a 3.89 and 3.71 electron volt. So those two are actually phonon replica. Phonon replica means once we have 4.09 EV emission, uh, that emitted energy could be absorbed or uh, could be absorbed by phonon. Then once phonon captures one phonon, phonon energy, then remaining will be emitted. It may be captured two phonon, then again it will emit another remaining uh, energy. So that's why we see that two, uh, two peaks, one for the one phonon absorption and another for the second absorption. So, so, so this sharp peak is absorbed in the one sample, which is annealed at 900 degrees C. And we compare the uh, spectrum with one which is not oxidized. So that is not there in the unoxidized material. So rest of the PLs are similar. So, so this sharp, sharp emission is in the UV range. So that's why this material can be used for the single photon emission in ultraviolet region. But before, before we can uh, uh, develop that, we need to understand what is this uh, coming from? And if we want to make it stronger or uh, uh, more efficient, then we need to understand this is coming from uh, this element or this impurity. So, so we try to find out, understand first, understand what's the behavior of this and what is the origin of uh, that transition. So rest of the uh, data or results are focusing on that. And before, before we saw that, there is also one paper uh, that was published by the French group. And they also found exactly the same nature of the spectrum. But what they found is, they found from a point, small point, you can see small red dot, red dot in the material. So they observed that emission only from that point. And they use the cathode luminescence, CL. Cathode luminescence means instead of heating with the laser, they, they, they use the cathode ray electron beam in the sample, and then it emits the light. So this is the spectrum. And that spectrum, if you compare with our result, this is exactly same, very precisely, same nature, but we observe from the whole material. Whole material means it's it's a uh, it's not the uh, uh, emission from one point. It's not the emission from one detail, or it's from the bulk properties. But whatever the origin, that origin is everywhere, and uh, the transition is very precise because the line width is uh, very narrow. So this line width is less than one nanometer. So our question is, what is the origin of that 4.0 EV emission? So in the wide band gap material, we have a, 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 a conduction band, we have valence band, and there is a big gap between conduction band and valence band. And theoretically, we say it is a forbidden gap, but in practice or in the reality, if there is some impurity, if there is some defect, or dislocation, those defect, dislocation and impurity energy level could appear in this uh, forbidden gap. So if we have any level here within the uh, forbidden gap, once we excite the material with the electron beam, and the laser, then electrons are excited to the uh, conduction band. And from the conduction band, when it comes down, it emits the light, but we are getting 4.09 EV. So that 4.09 EV is the energy difference between first energy level or excited energy level to the uh, ground state, lower energy state. So, so that kind of level is possible in the wide band gap material. And if that level is very, very fine, 
generally we see the gut kernel transition. So the question here is, first is where is that level? We know the difference, the difference is 4.09, but where is the, the starting point and where is the energy uh, end point? And where is those levels are? So uh, uh, these are the three possible ways. Uh, one, lay, one way is, is the, is the emission due to the transition of electron from conduction band to the level, one deep level, which is 4.01, 4.09 EV below. Another is electron transit from the connection band and transit somehow to the deep level, and then from there to balance band. And also it is possible, it, it is between the two level, two level, both are within the uh, forbidden gap. And that we call, uh, one is like a donor level, and another is like a, acceptor level and that's called the donor to acceptor peer transition. So, so there are some theoretical work uh, have been done and some theoretical paper says it could be a carbon in the nitrogen atom impurity gives this kind of uh, level. And also some people said it, 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 it could be carbon, carbon in the the carbon in the boron side and the carbon in the nitrogen side, when we have that kind of complex, then the energy level of that level will be nearby this. But still, their calculation energy are different, slightly different from the, the experimental result. So more theoretical work should be done. And also, we are also seeking collaboration with the theoretical people to find out where will be that kind of level and then how to uh, how it is possible to have such a deep level atomic like transition so so we did some more uh, experiments uh, and this is the one here is we perform a temperature dependent photoluminescence measurement and in the temperature we change the temperature from 8 Kelvin to 290 Kelvin, something like a very low temperature to room temperature. And we look at how the peak is changing and how the intensity is changing. So intensity decreases normally in the uh, photoluminescence as we increase the temperature because of the uh, thermal quenching. So, so if we have more uh, temperature, then there is more uh, thermal uh, energy, thermal uh, vibration or uh, uh, energy loss. So, so all the thermal activity will be more and then optical activity will be less. So intensity goes down. That's, that's uh, obvious. But if you look at the peak position, peak position is not changing at all. So if you look at the band gap, band gap, if you, if you increase the temperature, then atomic site will be uh, increased because of the thermal expansion. So that's why the band gap will decrease if you increase the temperature. So, so the band is emission will be also uh, decreased. But here, the peak position is not changing. Peak position means energy, energy position is not changing. And in another experiment, we increased or we, we use the different uh, power of the laser. So if you put a more power, then it might generate more uh, active that kind of deep level. So 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 in some cases, uh, like in the third option, like in the, this third option, if we put more light, more uh, uh, more, it will generate more that donor and acceptor meaning the distance between them will be small if you put more light, more intensity, then those donor and acceptor behave like a positive and negative particle and then there is a Coulomb interaction. So if the distance is small, Coulomb interaction will be large and then it will also uh, consequently it will change the peak position, energy position, but we are not seeing that. So based on this experiment, what we believe here is they are not donor to 
receptor-like transition, meaning they are not third option. They are not third option. And then also, uh, based on this uh, peak position is not changing with temperature. So our belief is this is also not the first option. So most likely it is the second option. But we need to do more uh, experiment to confirm that. And then uh, to understand inside the material that is causing that. So we perform uh, this XPS, uh, X-ray photo electron spectroscopy. So this can be used to determine what is the material or what are the atoms or concentration of the atom. It, it measures relative concentration uh, on the surface. So we tested both samples, which, is, which has the 4.01 emission and which, is, which doesn't have. So looking at the uh, atomic presence of these impurities, both are more or less same. It has some oxygen, carbon, and then uh, and, and most of the materials present on both are same. So it actually doesn't give us any uh, fruitful results. So and also problem is in the XPS, if the concentration is uh, less than one percent, or it, it is not very very sensitive to very small concentration. And also it has a problem with, it detects lots of oxygen and carbon, although they are not from the material. So, so this result is not very uh, useful. So what we decided is we try to remove, remove some of the layers on the top because that oxygen uh, and carbon can be from the from the surface of the material, so we try to clean up the material by uh, sputtering, meaning we bombard the material with uh, argon ion, and then remove top layer, very thin layer, maybe one atomic layer, and then uh, perform the XPS again. So once we perform the XPS. It, the carbon and the oxygen level is very largely reduced. So, so that means it may be the artifact coming from the surface. But once after that, when we took the uh, uh, PL photoluminescence again from that sample, we didn't see that 4.09 EV transition anymore. So. So, so, uh, so it could be simply due to the, uh, it could be uh, due to the surface effect and that will remove from the sample by sputtering. So what we did, we again anneal the sample, we heat up the sample again. That doesn't have that uh, 2.09 EV. We, we heated that up again, the same condition, 800 degrees Celsius for one hour, and redo the uh, PL photoluminescence. We got the 4.09 EV and similar structure, again, from the same sample. So, so what does that mean? So that means uh, this 4.09 is definitely coming from this oxid oxidation or the annealing process. But we still don't know what is the element involved. So, but we can definitely say it is not because of the bulk effect. If it is due to the bulk effect, it should show the 4.09 effect, 09 EV, even we remove the top uh, thin layer. So, so, so uh, for, for this, at this point, we can simply say, the oxidation process or the annealing process has generated or introduced that uh, atomic line and then that's why we, we, we were able to observe the atomic-like transition from the hexagonal boron nitrate uh, material. So, and we, we also tested the similar condition in the 
in the uh, another sample, another sample, but what we did is we systematically annealed the sample at different temperature, 100 degree, 300 degree, 500 degree, all for one hour. And then it started to appear around uh, 700 degree C. So, so that oxidation process might have changed the uh, defect structure or maybe there is some migration of the uh, vacancies. And if, if that's the case, we cannot detect those kind of signal from XPS. So that's also consistent. So at least uh, in, the, in terms of technology point of view, we were able to regenerate or reproduce that uh, from the annealing process. So to, to have our uh, broader knowledge, we performed a similar experiment for the powder. So it is the bulk material is normally good crystalline material. The powders are not that uh, crystalline quality won't be that good, but we still tried on the powder sample. So powder sample we perform in the same way. We uh, anneal the sample at different temperature and around 700 degrees C, we also observe the similar transition, very short transition at 4.09. That, that 4.09 is very, very precise. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's a powder or it's a bulk material. So, and uh, one is uh, successive uh, annealing, and then we also tried directly with the 700, and then we observed a similar, similar result. But in the powder form, if we zoom this area, in addition to 4.09 EV, there is also another set of similar uh, transition, uh, uh, very small, but it's like 4.12 EV and similar phonon replica. So what is this? We still don't know yet. So we are still exploring this 4.09 EV first. So, so, but we observe this only from the powder. So, so at this moment, we can simply conclude that uh, that 4.9 EV appear in the uh, bulk boron nitride. That is because of the oxidation or the annealing process. It is not from the bulk. It is not a bulk phenomenon. And the, that uh, transition is similar to the observed from the single point, single point defect. Uh, observed by another uh, group. And that defect most likely due to the transition from deep level to the balance path. So we still don't know what is exactly the, what is the chemical, chemical structure or the, the, which defect or which impurity or what kind of uh, uh, impurity complex. So that's still our uh, topic of our exploration. All right, so I will end here and then I will open for uh, questions. If you have. And I like to okay. acknowledge these people who are my PhD students, Nikesh, Bochai, Yusa, collaborator. Okay, uh, thank you, Mimzi, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, now the room is open for uh, questions, queries, comments. Now I have unmuted mic of everyone. Those who are experiencing noise on your side, please switch the mic off. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for organizing Zoom class. And Mimlal Sarlap in Namaskar. Namaskar. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Um, Mimlal, I have a question. Yeah, Meg has a question. Okay. Mimlal, sir. Wait, wait. Wait, Meg, uh, Dibagzi, just wait. Meg is already asking. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it is not a. Not that 
but a general question. When I work in this in uh, gallium nitride based material, mm -hmm. whether you grow CBT method or IVM method, you always have a you take at the surface. You talk about the surface morphology in your lab. Yeah. And uh, so do you have still have that defect? Are you, are you able to reduce the, the V shaped sheets at the surface of the indium gallium nitride quantum oil or gallium nitride? So is there any improvement or is it the same? Yes, so so the defect level is decreasing, but it's not decreasing. It, it takes long time to uh, reduce that kind of uh, material development. So after I I did that, probably the defect level is reduced by half by now. Okay. But uh, it is still too far. Okay. Compared to silicon. Okay. Silicon, silicon has been uh, developed in more than 50 years. Uh, gallium nitride is maybe simply 20 years. Okay. So it still has to go a long way. Okay, now Deepakji. Deepakji has a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you can ask. You are asking. I CBD, my banana, some my little use goes second. I only use got a thing of Balco and Balco Nale, single crystal. You think you think I'm a collaborator of Banago? Very banana. The position temperature on some more than one thousand degrees. Okay, uh, any 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 anyone else asking or any comment, suggestion, question? Very fantastic. Me. Is Lila, 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 yeah, Lila, madam, has a question. May madam go ahead, Lila. Ah, uh, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Eh? You are welcome. Ah, my level, you are spectrophotometer. Kineko, and your reflectance measurement, they go nice. I can't know. Hey, ma, further day, email bada contact goru na hai. Kya kya problem boyo? Vanira kya boyo kya boyo? Yo corona ali gore ra beach ma kya supplier apni gap boyo? Maga ali problem pore gole ma further contact gor sula. Kuch system manus na? Ocean optics ko. Aza ocean ko. Yeh jan four thao. Ocean optics go Indian, I know American. Oh, yes, are four thousand kinego. Full range for Madam Tio. You be an IR. You be some way. You be this, and I are kinego. I came my million. I will not put on us. Thank you. Any any further queries? Uh, hello, Mim sir. Ah, Sanjay, madam, go ahead. Ah, topic presentation is very good. Thank you. Ah, uh, I have a defect label. Jun, listen, sir. 
इलेक्ट्रॉन इन दैट इन्वायरमेंट इन दैट मेटेरियल मैंने बस व्हाट्स द एनर्जी रिक्वायर बने को तो क्या बनने के लिए व्हाट्स द एनर्जी रिक्वायर टू टू बिकम फ्री इलेक्ट्रॉन इफ यू कैन मेक इट फ्री इलेक्ट्रॉन देन दैट एनर्जी इज दैट मस एनर्जी इज द लेवल ऑफ द इंप्यूरिटी हाँ है ना अने If you can excite the electron and make it free, the electron will be in the collection bank. Ah. So how much energy you need? So that that energy level is that much energy below the collection bank. And it is this that your acceptor level of open this thing. How much energy required to accept one electron? Ah. And so so so. a uh, connection band and valence band are like a free electron region okay yeah. free electron or free hole region mm. okay uh, thank you meem ji and uh, we are getting late uh, just a moment suresh before suresh uh, saran has one question are you still there saran saran lami chane yes sir yes so can you ask or i have to ask for you Okay, Mim. Yes. Saran is asking why the uh, why you need one hour to observe luminescence phenomena. Why not immediately? <laughs> one hour. Ah. He Sorry, says. Sorry, Rajadhi. Saran. Okay, he is gone. Uh, Suresh, you ask your question. Where is Suresh? Suresh, me, I have me on mute. Gara, so the oh, Suresh. He was, he was raising hand, but I cannot see him now. Today, okay, I I have a general query, Mim. Uh, before we end, um, me pali me sochula layman question bago ayre. Mim, Anas, me ne pali. यो हमी नहीं जस्त यूबी सी चाहिए भैन तर मैं धेरे जो उ एकदम लेमेन भर सोच रहा हाई टू सिक्सटी नैनोमीटर नहीं प्रिफर कर देखु कला टू सिक्सटी तो मतलब डिस इन्फेक्ट में अथवा बायोमेडिकल एप्लीकेशन में क्या बैक्टेरियामिटी डेवलप कर तर टू सिक्सटी नहीं क्यों तल वन वन नाइन्टी अथवा टू हंड्रेड में गए धन स्ट्रंग होन्टी कट अफ हो टू एटी कट अफ ओजन ने डेवलप करने ओजन ने ओजन ने अब सपोज भन कसू सिक्सटी नैनोमीटर को सोर्स यूज गये 
त्यसको इन्टेन्सिटी कति चाहिन्छ भन्ने के हुन्छ इन्टेन्सिटी के फ्रिक्वेन्सीले मात्रै काम गर्छ फ्रिक्वेन्सी होइन अब फ्रिक्वेन्सी त पुइहाल्यो हैन हजुर हजुर अब इन्टेन्सिटी कुन कुरा जो सुनी रखे कम हो बिफोर आई एंड गुड नाइट भिफोर वी एंड मीम फर्दर लेट्स लेट्स थैंक जी एंड एवरीवन ऑलमोस्ट पार्टिसिपेंट आउट यूएस बिहान थैंक यू सो मच मिमजी गुड नाइट गुड नाइट रू छल पांच दस मिनट बस Including Mimzi and others who want to have informal discussion for few minutes. Thank you, Mim. Hi. Sir, thank you. Jala jala, Sushma sir, ya Janu sir. Mim sir, Raju sir, sabhi log aane wale hain. Ah. Hey Raju sir. मेरो यो भिडियो चाहिँ तपाईले अफ गर्नु भएको कि किन हो मेरो प्रब्लम भने के हो एकछिन हेर्दिन न। लम्म तपाईको तपाईको फोन हैन पाइन। सन्नु को भिडियो अफ गर्छु अरुको पो गर्छु त यो इन्फर्मल हो है अब हम मालिक जी भन्नु त सन्नु को कसैले अफ गर्ने हिम्मत गर्छ तपाईको नाम के हो तपाईको नाम के हो अ अफ छ के होइन हैन तपाईको नामै छैन के ए ल ल म नाम राखि राखि त्यो मेरो अफ भइराछ कि किन हो मैले थाहै पाइन त्यही भएर त्यही बाट हो हुन चाहिँ हैन यहाँ बाट त्यस्तो न मिल्दैन हैन संजू जी